My goodness, what a great ministry and what an opportunity we have to partner with uh, a professional men uh, and their wives as, um, as they are an auxiliary to the Gideons. And the work that they do around the world is absolutely amazing what God's doing through them. And I know you're going to be praying for them, and I know that you're going to contribute uh, to the work of Gideon's International. And uh, we're going to see great things happen for the Lord. Uh, I don't know about you. I know, yeah, I think I do know about you. I think we're all in agreement that this world needs Jesus. Um, and, and our nation needs Jesus, uh, clearly. I mean, that is absolutely clear to me that he is the answer uh, to so many of the perplexing problems that we face in the world today. Uh, if you have your Bibles open, and I hope you do, if you don't, uh, you'll see on the screen our scripture lesson today. And it'll be found in Hebrews chapter 4. The first part of this scripture may just sound kind of strange. It talks about a rest that is promised for God's people and how some of uh, people in the past did not attain the rest that God had in mind for them, uh, but how we really need to, to look forward to that rest and to enter into that rest. But I, I'm going to read all of that because I want you to know that everything we do in our lives have consequences. Uh, what you and I are doing here today has a consequence. Uh, the Bible says it like this. Uh, people have said, do you believe in karma? And I says, no, because karma says you get what you deserve. My Bible said Jesus took on himself what we deserve. He died for our sins. We deserve death, but he died for us. So in that sense, I don't believe in karma. I do, though, accept the scripture that says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So all of us today are doing are sowing. We're also reaping uh, because you always reap what you have sown. You always reap it later than you sowed it, and you always reap more than you sowed. That's just the law of the harvest. Charles Stanley said that so well a few years ago, and I, I completely agree with it. But this talks about something that is in our future. And it's also something we can enter into by the grace of God. But I want you to pay particular attention to, uh, uh, to, the, to a scripture, I think is verse 12 of this scripture today. Therefore let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them fail to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day, today, saying through David after so long a time, just as has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through, through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, 
But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Wow. Says much about the word of God and about the fact that God has something in store for all of us. We've already welcomed you this morning to a gathering of people who believe certain things. Very important things, I believe. We're here this morning to do something that is a blessing to all mankind. And that is, we have been called together to worship none other than our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Our church, as it is called, identifies with a national movement of over 80,000 strong who are like-minded in our beliefs. We call ourselves General Baptist. Not because we're just generally Baptist. We call ourselves General Baptist for two reasons. One, because we believe in the doctrine of general atonement. And what does that mean? We believe by the grace of God, Jesus Christ tasted death for every person. Every man, woman, boy, and girl. Jesus died for them. As a matter of fact, we hold the scripture so tightly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. General Baptists believe in the general atonement. When you came in this morning, I wanted you not to leave today until you hear this clearly. Jesus Christ died for you. He died for you as a person. He died for you because he loves you. That can be said for every man, woman, boy, and girl in this community and every man, woman, boy, and girl that has lived or will ever live. Jesus died for them. His blood covers our sins. That's what the Bible says when we come under his blood by faith. We also, as Baptists, believe certain things. And among them, we, of course, believe in believer's baptism by immersion. We also believe in something called the priesthood of the believer. While we are a part of a denomination called General Baptist, every church is autonomous. Every church is self-governing. Every church decides who its leaders will be. Every church decides who its pastor will be. No outside authority can tell that local church what to do, how to do it, or when to do it. Every General Baptist church absolutely decides on its own how it will govern itself and how it will function. We have a headquarters and we have people who serve us there, but they have no authority over us. The same is true whenever I read the Word of God and you listen to the Word of God. And whenever you take the Word of God home and you read it for yourself. I can get up here and preach the Word of God to you, and I believe what I'm preaching to you is the truth. But I can't force you to believe it. I can't force you to accept it. It is absolutely up to you as an individual to do that or to choose not to do it. As a matter of fact, whenever whoever wrote Hebrews was writing this, he was reminding the people he was writing to that some people listened to the Word of God, didn't believe it, didn't apply it to their life at all. They were totally disobedient. Others, hearing the Word of God, mingled it with faith, it had the, the work that God desired for it to have in their lives. Lives were changed. Priorities were changed. Hearts were changed. Uh, destination was changed for them. Everything was changed because the Word of God is a powerful thing in our lives. General Baptists have ten statements of faith. And among the statements of faith that General Baptists wholeheartedly believe or at least we say we believe, is this. We believe that the Holy Scriptures are the Old and New Testaments, the inspired and infallible Word of God, and therein is found the only reliable guide of Christian faith and conduct. If I was to unpack that, I could spend an awful long time just sharing with you what those special words mean. Inspired and breathed by God. God used human agents to write those words. Uh, there were several different authors that was used to, to write whatever was written in the scriptures. 
Uh, we don't know exactly who wrote Hebrews. It's attributed to Paul, but biblical scholars over the last 2,000 years have debated exactly who wrote it. But there's no doubt that it was inspired. Whoever wrote these words, it was inspired by God. God moved in that person's life. As a matter of fact, over in the book of Revelation, John is told to look and then to write down what he sees. And the power of God moving in his life is evident because it is inspired by God, because God was working through human agencies. We also believe that the word of God is infallible, and that is everything it says is right. Everything it says to us is true. We can absolutely depend on it. We also learn that it is our reliable guide, the only, really, the only reliable guide we have of Christian faith and conduct. Whenever we are faced with a question, especially moral and ethical questions in our life, questions that really need, where we need the wisdom of God to answer them, we go to the Word of God for the answer. And dear friends, I want you to know the answer is there. We'll search the scriptures, we will find them. Whenever we are confronted with something that seems new in our life, I love what the Bible tells us about the church of Berea or the people of Berea. Whenever the Apostle Paul came preaching there, the Bible says that the Bereans were more noble than I think the Thessalonians because when they heard what Paul was preaching, they went to the Word of God and started searching it to see whether or not what they were hearing was true. Wouldn't that be great today whenever we hear something on television and we go, wait a minute now, does that match up to the Word of God? And we go to the Word of God and search the Word of God, and if it didn't align with the Word of God, we would say, well, that's not for me. See, that's, that's how, what it means to have God's Word as a reliable guide of faith and also conduct. We believe that as a hub is the center of the wheel, the Lord Jesus Christ is the heart of the Holy Scriptures. And all phases of Christian life, all phases are kind of like spokes that come out of that circle. All that we do finds its center in Christ, the Word of God. The church, its mission, teaching agencies, evangelistic efforts, life and power and motivation is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible is the written account of God's Word. Paul said of the Old Testament, by the way, don't neglect the Old Testament writings. Jesus didn't. He quoted them often. The Apostle Paul quoted them often. Don't neglect them. And this is why. In Romans chapter 15 verse 4, Paul said, Whatever was written in earlier times were written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now Paul wasn't referring to Acts at that time. He wasn't referring to the book of Hebrews at that time. It wasn't written, all likelihood, whenever he wrote those words to the Romans. What he was referring to was the Psalms and to Proverbs, to the Pentateuch, to the writing of the prophets, to all that we know of as the Old Testament. And he was saying to us, listen, when you go back there and you read how God has dealt with us, when you read about God's mighty power and His work in creation, when you read about how, how God loved us so much that when we disobeyed Him, He had a plan to save us, when you start following through how God made that happen, you're going to be encouraged, you're going to find instruction, and you're going to find wisdom. God's Word gives us encouragement, and it inspires perseverance. Just one example of it, is, I think, is found in Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10 where the Apostle Paul wrote this to a church that he was very angry with at that point. Let us not lose heart in doing good. He may have said that just as much for his own benefit as he did for them. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. My, how we need to unpack this scripture. 
I think we need to put it on our forearm. We need to put it on our forehead. And I'll tell you why. We have heard too much rancor lately. We have tasted too much bitterness. We have gone through and are still going through a very divisive time in our nation. And dear friends, I want you to know it's affecting church life as well. People all over this great land are angry and divided. And it's becoming clear and clear with every passing day. The church of Jesus Christ needs to be speaking with truth, but it also needs to be speaking with grace. We need to be speaking with kindness. We need to show it to each other. Uh, whenever in the example that Brother Tom gave us about two men in Jordan, whenever that man came to, that, uh, to the, the man that he had noticed, he said, what's different about you? People in our culture need to be asking the same question about us. What's different about you? Why is it that your, that your life is different? Why is your conversations different? Why are the words you choose to use different than what we hear out in our culture so often? And the answer we need to give them is the same one he gave them. Because the word of God, Jesus Christ, lives in my heart and he has changed me. We've seen too much ugliness. We've tasted too much bitterness. If we would only, just in our own community, live out this scripture, my, what a change we would see. This scripture is so much encouragement to me, but let me add some more to it. There may be times in your life when you wonder at the investment you're making in your local church or in Gideon's International or you're given to missions. You may wonder if it's really worth it or not. I want you to listen to Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. He who receives you, Jesus said, he was talking to his disciples now, he who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And, he, and whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Everything you do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is something that is noticed. It may not be noticed here. You may not get a plaque of recognition for it. No one may pat you on the back and say how wonderful a job you're doing in this world. You may not get a higher rank. You may not get a higher salary. But I want you to know something. In heaven, it's noticed. In heaven, it's noticed. I love that song that was sung at Mildred's funeral. That song that said, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. If really, if we, all of us think about it today, every one of us here who knows Jesus Christ, our life was changed by the investment of someone else who loved the Lord Jesus Christ enough to invest best time, best talents, best money, energy, to give up things maybe they would enjoy doing, to invest in something that was worth far more. The Bible is powerful and it's wonderful. See, dear friends, we find encouragement and instruction in the words of Scripture. But there's even more. We also have the good news. As a matter of fact, the best news that anyone has ever heard. I already quoted you one of the great Scriptures, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Did you hear those words? Oh yeah, they're words of wisdom in God's Word. Uh, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25. The gracious man will prosper, and he who waters will himself be watered. My, that's a great scripture. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 19. Truthful lips will be established forever, but a lying tongue is only for a moment. Some things last and some things are blown away like the chaff. 
These are just a few examples of what I call or and what is called wisdom writings. All of them are good. And of course, there are laws and there's rules that restrain us and give us boundaries for our lives. But dear friends, there's nothing in the Bible any better than the, just the plain old gospel. For God so loved every one of us that He gave His only Son for every one of us. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 says, But we do see Him who was made a little lower, uh, was made a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that the, by the grace of God He might taste death for everyone. The good news is powerful. It's liberating. It's filled with wisdom. It's filled with instruction. It's filled with encouragement. And dear friends, there's something else about the Bible that I can't say about any other book. And that is, it is alive and it is powerful. The word literally means energetic. Energetic. Paul said this mighty, uh, this power mightily works within him, and dear friends, it also mightily works within us as well. That's what the writer of Hebrews said. The word is compared to a sharp, two-edged sword. Literally, the word two-edged means branching both ways. Because the Bible says not only does it discern, but it also pierces our hearts. Hmm. Have you ever read the Word of God or heard the Word of God preached and felt like David when old Nathan walked into him and said, You are the man? Showed to him his own sin, his own rebellion against God, spoke truth to power. Have you ever felt that way when you're going through the Scriptures and you realize what it's talking about is you? Something you did wrong, some act of rebellion that you perpetrated against your own God, and it just points it right out in your life. Have you ever maybe felt like Belshazzar? He was king. He was a powerful man. Threw a party one night, a drunken party. Had all of his leaders to come in to show them just how powerful he was. He even took golden cups that had been consecrated to God and to His service that had been captured whenever the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem and, and tore up the temple. Took those golden cups with them back to Babylon. There he was pouring wine and drinking wine and honoring his own gods. And while he was in the act of doing that, he looked over and he saw a portion of a man's hand writing something on the wall. None of his wise men could interpret it. But when old Daniel walked in, now stooped with age, but his eyes wasn't dim, he could see clearly what that writing was. And he said to Belshazzar, among other things, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Dear friends, when we come before God with the notion that somehow we're going to tip the scales of His justice with our own good works, the Bible is going to point out to us we are always weighed in the balance and found wanting when we do that. Always. Because nothing is weightier than the blood of Jesus Christ. And our sins are many. It takes something weighty to balance that scale. It takes something holy and wonderful to balance that scale. All the things I bring before God, all the things I could bring before Him and say, Here, God, this earns your approval. None of those things are as weighty as one drop of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So old Belshazzar was weighed in the balance and he was found wanting. And if we think we're going to come before God with our good works and all the great things we've done and all of our good intentions, I want you to know we're going to stand before God just like Belshazzar. Or maybe you have come before God in your times of desperate loneliness. Maybe you've been so discouraged and felt so hopeless that you wondered if there was any reason to go on. And then you read about a man by the name of Elijah who heard a still, small voice. God gave him a mission and a ministry and he went out to perform it. Or maybe you were like the servant Elisha 
He was surrounded, he believed, and his servant was in despair. Until Elisha said, God, open the eyes of your servant. And when he looked around, he realized that he was surrounded by angels. God already had everything perfectly under control. Maybe there's been times in your life where you felt like everything was lost and nothing could be salvaged in your life. Only to have your eyes open to see that God had constantly been surrounding you with His grace. Maybe you've been like Naaman, who was so disappointed in God's provision for his own salvation and healing. But that was the one God provided. And when he was obedient, he was blessed with healing. Maybe you've been like Job in your life. You found no fault in yourself, but you were ready to judge God. Then the Word of God came to you. You realized that you, standed, you stood before God just like Job when God said, Job, be like a man, stand before me. And when God started interrogating Job and asking him some questions, most of them rhetorical, the Bible said Job put his hand over his mouth and said, I have spoken like a man with no knowledge. I have been in that place in my life. Maybe you have too. And if any of these things apply to your life, and they could be so, much, so many more, you would have to agree with me that the Word of God is a powerful force in your life. It's been a powerful force in our culture, in our world. Brother Tom mentioned to you how many people who formed our government really was so influenced by the Word of God. It's a powerful thing, isn't it? This morning, it has the power to convict has the power to make you feel terrible about the way you've lived your life before God. It has the power to condemn and to show us where we're going to spend eternity without God. It also has the power to lift us up and to give us hope whenever we hear that Jesus Christ loved us so much that He died for us. By the grace of God, He tasted death for every single one of us. That's where we stand before our God. That's why we support things like Gideon's International. That's why we send missionaries out to do their work. Because you know what, folks? I want some fruit from Africa. I want to know that because of the investment of this church, people are going to be saved in Nigeria. I want to, I want to feel in my heart that I have some fruit in, in uh, places like India, and places like Saipan, and places like the Philippines. I want to have some fruit there. I want to enjoy it. I want to taste it. I want to savor it. I want to be a part of that. Because I know that the power of Jesus Christ preached from the Word of God preached, boy, is going to change people's lives forever. This morning we're going to ask for a song. I'm going to ask you to stand in just a few moments. With our heads bowed, the altar open. If anyone come, needs to come and pray, the altar is always open. If you're lost in your sins, if you feel like you need to come here and pray at this altar, that's exactly where you need to be. You bow your head anywhere you are, anytime, and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart. He can change your heart and life right there. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what God can do in your life. Then Brother Tom's going to be back by the door when you leave here today. So I said, you're not going to go hungry. You're not going to suffer anything bad because you have given to the ministry of Gideon's. No, God will bless you for doing that. I really believe that with all my heart. Let's stand together. The Bible is the revelation of God's will. The Bible is set a law. It is the revelation of God's love in written form. I want you to know something, folks. It's eternal. Heaven and earth may pass away, but the living, powerful, piercing Word of God, it'll last forever. I'm glad today that we are people of the book. We're people who believe the Bible. We allow it to guide our lives. And if there's anyone here this morning that's not a Christian, 
I pray that you will believe it. You will believe it with all your heart. The Holy Spirit will open it to you. Make you aware of its deep meanings. And you will embrace it. Love it. And it will start a work in you. Lord Jesus, we just love you this morning. We thank you, God, for the work of Gideon's. Thank you, God, for the ministry of this church and other churches in this community. We pray, God, your blessings on Brother Tom and on all the Gideons in our local camp. We ask you, God, to give them success as they pray for other Gideons, as they pray for the work in their church, as they raise money to share the gospel with people around the world. And Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to be involved in ministries such as this. Good things. Things that really help people, change their lives. Lord, I, I pray for this service today. And if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as Savior and Lord of their life, we pray they would be saved. Dear God, we just ask you now to go with us as we leave this service and go to Sunday school. We pray, Lord, you would bless us in that time of learning and discipleship. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.